Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If we're going to be guided to Jesus, we must hear and believe the word of God. If there is any wisdom that we can glean today, it must be from the word of God. If there is any illumination as to how we should walk, how we should talk, how we should live, it's going to be from the word of God. And so we must give credence to the word of God. I greet you in the almighty name of Jesus Christ, the highest name that man can ever utter from his mortal lips. It is indeed an honor to have our visitors with us. And we want you to know that you are our most honored guests. And we would like the opportunity to shake your hand, give you a high five, give you a hug, whatever it is, to show you our expression that we are so happy to have you here. And of course, our sister congregations, thank you so much for coming and being a part of our worship here today. And to our church family, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today because when we see you we're always encouraged because we know that God is working faithfully in our lives and he has given us a certain measure of health and strength to make it out one more time our hearts go out to the family of sister Travis sister Charlotte Travis of course um, when she was well uh, she was here and uh, not too long ago um, something like three, maybe three weeks ago from today, uh, she was here. She was here. And if, if, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be, but if I'm not mistaken, uh, that was a message that I preached. Um, it ain't over until God says that it's over. And I believe that, that she heard uh, that message. Well, I'm so thankful that God saw fit to take her out of her suffering, her pain, her agony, and to now bring her into the bosom of comfort. Um, I had the occasion of visiting her several times uh, in the hospital, and uh, you're talking about somebody who had uh, enough faith that when she talked about her situation, she talked about the positive things in her situation. The times in which she had to go to the hospital, she had to get her toes amputated. But in her talking about having her toes amputated, she gave God the praise. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't take my feet. You see that? You can only think like that if you have faith in God. So I thank God for her example. I thank God for her life. And let us keep her family in our prayers. We know that there are many that we need to continue to keep in our prayers, those whom we haven't seen in quite some time. Been spending a lot of time with Sister Cheryl Robinson Miller. Went, was with her Thanksgiving morning. And please continue to keep her in your prayers. Um, that's a situation in which we have to continually give it over to God. Let's keep Sister Daphne Stewart in our prayers. She hasn't been with us in quite some time, and uh, we want uh, to just lift her up in our prayers. Sister Nancy Williams as well, I'm noting, is, uh, has been missing. And, of course, we've prayed for uh, Brother Quiller Harris. Let's keep him in our prayers. But we also, again, give God thanks for those who are struggling with their health. Uh, the Coleman's are here. Sister Baylor is here. And this is our, these are our examples of how we should be, uh, how our desire should be for the Lord. Uh, you know, uh, let's keep Sister Dominique uh, in our prayers as well. Um, she's been struggling with her health and uh, Let's keep, uh, she's the daughter of the drivers, brother and sister drivers. Uh, let's keep her uh, in our prayers as well. Good to see everybody 
And uh, thank you, brothers and sisters, for your service on today thus far. Our scripture reading for uh, today, good to see all those that are back from college as well. Good to see you, uh, some uh, looking older, amen, amen, uh, than they did, uh, full-grown beards and, and twisties, amen, uh, looking like full-grown people. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, just just uh, good to see you, good to see you. You're looking educated as well, amen. I guess school does the body good, I guess. Amen. Uh, good. Good to see you. Uh, good to see everybody. We want to keep our uh, young adults in our prayers, especially those who are traveling uh, back and forth, those who have to even get on the road uh, later on today. We want to keep them in our prayers. The scripture reading that you have heard in today's scripture uh, is taken from uh, Exodus chapter 12, uh, verses 21 through uh, 27. Exodus uh, chapter 12, verses 21 through 27. Oh, just a word about Sister Travis. Uh, funeral arrangements, they have not been made yet. And uh, as soon as they are made, uh, we will let you know uh, the schedule of her funeral arrangements. So they have not been made at all yet. Uh, Exodus 12, starting with verse number 21. If you're there, say amen. And the Bible reads, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with uh, the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children so shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worship. Before we get into our lesson, one other thing um, just came to mind. Sister Eggerson uh, had emergency surgery yesterday. Dawn and I were able to go and see her, and she had just got out of uh, surgery. And, uh, you know, she was on the good stuff, uh, meaning that she could barely, barely talk and struggling uh, just to get her words out to us. In other words, she was looking like, I wish y'all would leave. Uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, in the best spirits possible, and she's holding on to God's unchanging hand. Let's keep Sister Eggerson in our prayers uh, as well. Amen. I want to uh, speak from uh, the title of uh, Get Ready for Your Deliverance. Get Ready for Your Deliverance. The word deliverance means the act of being rescued or set free. If there was ever a time in society that people needed to be rescued or set free, that time is today. People have been plagued by so much just this year alone. Just in this year, there were victims of hurricanes in places like Florida and Texas and Puerto Rico. 
There were victims of wildfires in California. There were mass shootings all over the United States. You may remember one of the deadliest shootings there were this year was in Las Vegas, where a man decided to take it upon himself to fire his rifle into a crowd of thousands, killing 59 and wounding 500. There have been all kinds of church shootings. You may recall the shooting in Antioch, Tennessee. You also may remember the shooting in Sutherland, Texas, where there were 26 people killed in that shooting. There were instances all over the world of people using their vehicles to kill people on the sidewalks or in the streets. You know, people have also become slaves to, life, to the lifestyle and, uh, of this world. And it is because of that that keeps them in a spirit of bondage. People are struggling with sobriety from alcohol and drugs. People are struggling with sexual immorality. People are struggling with the habit of cursing. People are struggling with the habit of gambling. People are robbing other people. People are going into homes and burglarizing homes. People are stealing other people's vehicles. People are driving erratically and then when they hit you or cause you to hit them, they want to turn around and want to shoot you. As though you did something wrong. We need to know today that God specializes in these particular cases where his people are in bondage. And the message for his people today is get ready for your deliverance. With all of the heartache and pain and suffering and despair that we are plagued with in life, God just didn't allow us to go through what we're going through just to go through it. But God wants us to understand that he's allowing us to go through the midst of it so that we can prepare ourselves for our deliverance. When we look at Exodus chapter 12 and we look at verse number 40, in Exodus 12, in verse number 40, it tells us that the children of Israel were in Egypt some 430 years. Now, that's an incredibly long period of time to be in bondage. But may I suggest to you today that some of us have experienced some bondage for a very long period of time ourselves. You may not have been in anybody's Prison. You may not have been in anybody's city jail, but in your mind, some of us have been in bondage for a very long time. Satan has come into our minds and have uh, taken control of our thoughts to the degree to where we ourselves feel like we don't even have control of our own mind. Some of us know what it feels like to be in bondage for a long time. And as a result of the children of Israel being in slavery that long, they started to be influenced by immoral behavior. One of the things that they were inundated with was the worship of false gods, idols. The Egyptians loved to put carven images up where people could bow down to them 
and worship them. They love the, the uh, uh, carving the images of animals and posting them in prominent places so people could bow down and worship them. These are the types of things that had their impact on the mindset of the children of Israel. And we know what this idol worship was about. We know what an idol is. It is an image or a representation of God, of a God used as an object of worship. It can be a person. It can be a thing. A thing that is greatly admired, loved, or revered. So when God started to deliver the children of Israel out of their oppression from the enemy, he not only had to demonstrate his power to the enemy, but he also had to teach his own people that he alone is God and that he is all powerful. And he's powerful enough to deliver them out of their circumstances. Can I just say this to those that are influenced and in bondage to Satan today? God is powerful enough to deliver you from your circumstance. Today, God wants to deliver his people from the oppressive nature of Satan and sin. But he also wants to teach us that he is God alone and will not share his glory with any other God. And because some of us have been so influenced by the enemy, some of us have put our children before God. Some of us have put our spouse before God. Some of us have put our boyfriends, our girlfriends, first in front of God. Some of us have put our careers in front of God. Some of us have put school in front of God. Some of us have even put ourselves in front of God. Any of these things can become idols in our lives if we let them. And God doesn't want us to have any other gods in our lives. Turn with me really quick to Exodus chapter 20. And we want to look at verses 1 through 5. And I want us to see... What God has to say about putting other things before him. I want you to hear God in his own words. In Exodus chapter 20 and verses 1 through 5. If you have it, just say amen. amen. And the word of God reads. And God spake all these words saying. I am the Lord thy God. Which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. Thou shall not have, or thou shall have no other, what? Gods before me. Thou shall not make unto thee any, what? Graven image, or any likeness of anything that is where? In heaven above, or that is where? In the earth beneath, or that is in the, what? Water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. He says, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. He says, I'm a jealous God. I'm a God that can't tolerate you worshiping, bowing down to some other God. I'm a God that can't tolerate you putting someone or something in front of me. I'm a God that has led you out of all of your distress before. 
and I can't stand for you to treat me like I'm in last place. And that's the type of God that we serve. He is, in fact, a jealous God. When we look at scripture back in Exodus uh, chapter 8, and we look at verse number 1, Exodus chapter 8 and verse number 1. The Bible says in Exodus 8 and verse number 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. The Lord wanted them out of bondage so that they could freely serve him. Not Pharaoh. And certainly not idols. The children of Israel had acculturated into the Egyptian society so much that the thing that caused them to cry unto the Lord was the affliction that God had allowed them to go through by their captors. And certainly God didn't want them to stay in that condition at all. And God doesn't want us today to stay in the condition that we're in, in bondage. In Exodus chapter three, verses seven through 10, the Bible says this, Exodus three, starting with verse number seven. The Bible says, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the what? Affliction of my people. I'm so glad that he can see our affliction. Amen. Which are in Egypt and have heard their what? Their cry. I'm so glad that he hears the cries of the righteous by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows and I am come down to do what? Deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them come now therefore and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people the children of Israel out of Egypt may I suggest to you today that some of us here also have acculturated ourselves into this world, into the society today. So much that God has allowed us to experience afflictions so that we can cry unto him. Sometimes we have to go through what we have to go through so that God ends up getting the glory out of what we're going through. Sometimes we get so comfortable in being around those who don't love the Lord, being around those who could care less about the Bible and God's will, being around those that oppose God himself. Sometimes we get so comfortable around them that we let down our God, our guards rather. We let them down to the degree to where we start to think, that anything can go, anything can work out because God loves us. Well, I want you to know that God is a jealous God and anything can't go. You putting anything in front of God, God is displeased with. And sometimes he allows us to go through our affliction so that we can call out and cry out to him so that we can know that our dependence must be upon him. 
so that we can know that our deliverance is not within ourselves, but only comes from God. In Psalms 34, in verse number 19, the Bible says there many are the afflictions of the righteous. But get this, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. It doesn't matter what type of affliction you have today. The Lord is able to deliver you out of that affliction. I can remember in my own little life, how time and time again, God came through for me and delivered me out of every affliction there was in my life. And at the time, I didn't know how he was going to do it. I just had faith that he would do it. And you know, sometimes you can be in a situation where the situation happens so quickly that you don't even have time to think about it. You recall the time that I told you that uh, I, I, I fell out on the plane, I blacked out. Y'all, some, some of you remember that? I didn't understand, I didn't know that I was gonna black out, I didn't know the condition that I was in, but my family knew about it. You see that? My family knew about it. They were the ones that were looking at me. You see, sometimes your affliction is not about you, but it's about those who are around you. And God was testing, really, my family to see how they would react to the situation. But praise be to God, some prayers were lifted up. Praise be to God that God came through and, and he delivered me out of my affliction. And I'm here to tell you for a surety that God is able to deliver you out of yours. Amen. God is a God that's, that specializes in when we go through affliction, when we are in bondage, he specializes in delivering us. When we find ourselves in a spot where we have allowed the world to influence us and not we the world, we can so easily succumb to a mindset that God is not pleased with. But God wants us to turn back to him. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 14. The Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I want you to know today that all you have to do is repent. Change from the worldly way and come back to God. And God will hear your request from heaven and forgive you of your sin. As many of you know, God used ten plagues to get Pharaoh to release the children of Israel. Of course, a plague is and can be categorized as a disease or that which causes something to be stricken. The plagues were designed to or for Pharaoh to see God's power, but not also, but not only Pharaoh, but also God's children as well. And moreover, it was designed to show God's power over all of the false gods of the Egyptians. When God allowed the first three plagues to happen, they all affected not only the Egyptians, but they affected the children of Israel. You may recall uh, when the Nile was turned into blood, when frogs started leaping everywhere. Do you recall this, anybody? 
Uh, you may recall when the gnats or the lice uh, 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 were everywhere, getting on every body. But this included the children of Israel. And have you ever wondered why God would allow them to go through the same suffering as the enemy while he was trying to deliver them? Why would he allow them to suffer along with the enemy? Could it be that they too had to understand God is a jealous God and that he will have no other gods before him? Sometimes we ask ourselves why it is that we're caught up in the same punishment as someone else. But could that be God trying to show us that maybe we have put things before him. The good news is, is that if you have a repentant mindset, you can get ready for your deliverance. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, and the verse is number 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, and the verse is number 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But his long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants us all to come to repentance. When we look at the next six plagues, which only affected the Egyptians, and didn't affect the children of Israel. God had shown his power over the Egyptians and over their gods. You remember the plagues of the flies, the plague of the uh, disease that, were, that was on the cattle, the plague of the boils, the plague of the hail coming from the sky, the plague of the locusts, the plague of utter darkness. All of these things affected the enemy only. So you say, okay, what could have been the reason for this? Well, in the first three plagues, they affected both the enemy and the children of Israel. The enemy could have looked at those plagues as some type of natural disaster. Could have attributed it to something else besides the true, the one and living God. But with these next six ones, they only affected the enemy. And by the time that the frogs came onto the scene, the people that were in Pharaoh's camp said, this truly comes from God. In other words, they got the picture. They got the fact that these plagues were coming from God. And God allows us to go through our plagues today. Amen. And we got to understand that we're being allowed to go through these things so that we can cry out to God so that he will deliver us. Of course, after each one of the plagues, Pharaoh again hardened his heart and wouldn't let the children of Israel go. But Pharaoh is a type or a representation of Satan. You know, Satan is our enemy. Amen. Now, I didn't get an amen. I, I, I got to say it again because I don't know. I, I thought I was speaking for everybody. Amen. But let me, wait now, wait now. Let me say it again because I want to look at some mouths move. I said, uh, 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 Satan is our enemy. Amen. amen. Okay, I just had to check and see where I was. Amen. Amen. Satan is our enemy, but Satan doesn't want to let us go so quickly, does he? He wants to keep us in his grip, keep us under his control, keep us under his influence. And he doesn't want to let go. But this is the time that we shouldn't give up as children of the Lord. We have to keep on holding on to God's unchanging hand until our deliverance come. And this is why Paul wrote in the book of Ephesus, in Ephesians chapter 6. Please turn over there real quick. And we're almost done. 
Well, you say, oh, praise God. We're almost done. In Ephesians chapter 6, let's look over there real quick. In Ephesians chapter 6, we're concerned with verses 10 through 13. We have to understand that in today's world, it's not about him and it's not about her. But the real enemy is Satan. The real enemy is Satan. When we look at Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse number 10, the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be what? Strong in the Lord. And what? In the power of his might. And then do what? Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, who is the real fight against in verse number 12? For we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood, but against who? Principalities. Against what? Powers. Against who? The rulers of darkness of this world. Against what? Spiritual weaknesses. Where? In high places. Wherefore? Take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to do what? Stand. You know, affliction on the body can just make you want to crumble, can make you want to give up, can make you have a mindset of despair. That's why we need to have the whole armor of God on during these times so that we can understand that in the midst of my affliction I can still stand even though the situation is not going the way that I want it to go I can still stand that's why knowing the word of God is serious Putting on the whole armor is serious so that we can stand. And then God had a final plague in mind that he told Moses and Aaron about. And this plague would kill all the firstborn of the Egyptians and the firstborn of their cattle. This final plague would be God's final judgment against the gods of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 12, the Bible says there, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. With this final plague, the Israelites had to be careful because if they were not obedient to what God had said to do, they too would be impacted in a negative way by this plague. So in our lesson text in Exodus 12 and 21, the Bible states there, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. Now the children of Israel were told in Exodus 12 verses 3 through 7 the purpose for this. And that each household needed to get a male lamb without blemish. One that was one year old. They had to kill it in the, in, in the celebration that would be known as the Passover. Then when we look in Exodus 12, verses 22 and through 23, the Bible says there, And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood on the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. The purpose 
of this, of course, was to allow them to see that salvation was through the blood of the Lamb. Salvation was through the blood of the Lamb. And if we are going to have salvation today, we have to understand and recognize that salvation is through the blood of the Lamb. I'm so thankful that even though from time to time we find ourselves in a place of bondage, we find ourselves in a place of of affliction, God knows exactly where we are. And God knows exactly what we're going through. I'm so glad that even in the midst of you going through what you are going through and me going through what I'm going through and they going through what they're going through, God has has in his sight me as an individual. And he knows exactly what I as an individual am going through. And he specializes in deliverance while a person is in bondage. But if we're not careful, if we're not obedient to him, we can have a negative effect by the persecutions and by the affliction that we go through. And if we're not careful, we can end up blaming God for all the things that we're going through. God is a God that can save us in the midst of what we're going through. And if we're going to be saved, we have to be saved by the blood of the lamb i'm so glad that jesus came to this world to live a perfect life and jesus is that perfect lamb of god i'm so glad that when john saw him uh walking john and his disciples john's disciples was with him he pointed to Jesus, looking at Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And that same Lamb we got to believe in today, that same Lamb went to Calvary's cross and shed his blood on the cross for your sins and my sins. If he didn't shed his blood, then there would be no forgiveness of sin. I'm thankful that the Lamb came to this world to save me from my affliction, to save me from the things that I've gone through I'm so glad that he still has the power to deliver that's the Lamb of God that we need to trust in today well how do you take benefit of the blood today well you got to be in Christ how do you get in Christ by hearing his word number one so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, according to Romans 10, 17. You must believe what you have heard, according to Hebrews 11 and verse number 6. Then you must repent. Amen. Jesus says in Luke 13 and 3, I tell you nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And then you need to make the confession of your faith, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then. You must be baptized in the watery grave of baptism, according to Acts 2 and 38, where Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Once one does that, they are baptized into Christ. When you are in Christ, you come into contact with his blood. And it is his blood that then covers you. Just like they covered the doorposts and that angel of death went over. It is his blood when you are in Christ that covers you and that protects you. Amen. And that forgives you of your sins. You got to be in contact with the lamb's blood. And then you are added to his church, according to Acts 2 and 47. And then the expectation is that you live faithful unto death, according to uh, Revelations 2 and 10. The question is, 
Have you been saved the Bible's way? Have you given your life over to the Lord the Bible's way? If you haven't, we encourage you to do that today. And of course, if you find that you are in a place of, affic- uh, of affliction, you're in a place of bondage in your mind, and, 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 and please don't look around when, when I say this. Just know within yourself what you're going through. If you're in that place, we, we need to pray for you, and we need to pray with you. Whatever's on your mind, make it known together while we stand and sing our Savior song of invitation.